Can you give an overview of what OpenAI Codex and GitHub Copilot is, how it works, and why the hell it works so well? So with GPT-3, we noticed that the system, uh, you know, the system trained on all the language out there, started having some rudimentary coding capabilities. So we're able to ask it, uh, you know, to implement addition function between two numbers. And indeed, it can write Python or JavaScript code for that. And then we thought uh, we might as well just go full steam ahead and try to create a system that is actually good at what we are doing every day ourselves, which is programming. We optimize models for proficiency in coding. We actually even created models that both have a comprehension of language and code. And Codex uh, is API uh, for these models. So it's first pre-trained on language, and then I don't know if you can say fine-tuned, because there's a lot of code, but it's language and code. It's language and code. It's also optimized for various things, like uh, let's say low latency and so on. Codex is the API that's similar to GPT-3. Mm -hmm. uh, we expect that there will be proliferation of the potential uh, products that can use coding capabilities, and I can sp uh, I, I can speak about it in a second. Mm -hmm. Copilot is the first product uh, developed by GitHub. So as we're building uh, models, we wanted to make sure that these models are useful, and we work together with GitHub on building the first product. Copilot is actually, as you code, it suggests you code completions, and we have seen in the past, there are like a various tools that can suggest how to like a few characters of the code or the line of code. The, the thing about Copilot is it can generate 10 lines of code. You, it's often the way how it works is you often write in the comment what you want to happen because people in comments, they describe what happens next. So um, these days when I code, instead of going to Google to search, uh, for the appropriate code to solve my problem, I say, oh, for this array, could you smooth it? And then, you know, it imports some appropriate libraries and mm -hmm. say it uses NumPy convolution or so I, that I was not even aware that exists mm -hmm. and it does the appropriate thing. Uh, so you, uh, you write a comment, maybe the header of a function and it completes the function. Of course, you don't know what is the space of all the possible small programs it can generate. What are the failure cases? How many edge cases? How many subtle errors there are? How many big errors there are? It's hard to know, but the fact that it works at all on, in a large number of cases is, is incredible. It's like a, it's a kind of search engine into code that's been written on the internet. Correct. So for instance, when you search things online, then usually you get to the, some particular case. Like if you go to Stack Overflow, people, uh, describe the one particular situation mm -hmm. uh, and then they seek for a solution. But in case of uh, Copilot, it's aware of your entire context and in context is, oh, these are the libraries that you are using. That's the set of the variables that is initialized. And on the spot, it can actually tell you what to do. So the interesting thing is, and we think that the Copilot is one possible product using Codex, but there is a place for many more. So. Internally, we tried out, you know, to create other fun products. So it turns out that a lot of tools out there, let's say Google Calendar or Microsoft Word or so, they all have an internal API to build plugins around mm -hmm. it. So there is a way in the sophisticated way to control Calendar mm -hmm. or Microsoft Word. Today, if you want, if you want more complicated behaviors from these programs, you have to add a new button for every behavior. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it is possible to use Codex and uh, tell, for instance, to Calendar, uh, could you schedule an appointment uh, with Lex uh, next uh, week after 2 p.m.? Mm -hmm. And it writes corresponding piece of code. And that's the thing that actually you want. So interesting. So the, w what you figure out is there's a lot of programs with which you can interact through code. And so there you can generate that code from natural language. That's fascinating. And, and that's somewhat like also closest to uh, what was the promise of Siri or Alexa. Yeah. So previously, all these behaviors, they were hard-coded. Hand, uh, hard yeah. And it seems that Codex on the fly can pick up the API of, uh, let's say, given software. Yeah. And then it can turn language into use of this API. So without hard-coding, it can find, it can translate to machine language. 
correct it to a, so for example, this would be really exciting for me, like for, for um, Adobe products like Photoshop, uh, which is the, I think uh, action script. Uh, I think there's a scripting language that communicates with them. Same with Premiere. And, and you could imagine that that allows even to uh, do coding by voice on your phone. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in the past, like uh, as of today, I'm not editing Word documents on my phone because it's just the keyboard is too small. But if I would be able to tell uh, to my phone, you know, uh, make the header large, mm -hmm. then move the paragraphs around and it does actually what I want. So I can tell you one more cool thing or even how I'm thinking about co codex. So if you look actually at the evolution of, uh, of computers, we started with a very primitive interfaces, which is a punch card and punch card essentially you make a holes in the, in the plastic card to indicate zeros and ones. Mm -hmm. And, uh, during that time, there was a small number of specialists who were able to use computers. And by the way, people even suspected that there is no need for many more people to use computers. Um, uh, but then we moved from punch cards to at first assembly then C. And uh, these programming languages, they were slightly higher level. They allowed many more people to code and they also uh, led to more of a proliferation of technology. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, further on, there was a jump to say from C++ to Java and Python. And every time it has happened, more people are able to code and mm -hmm. we build uh, more technology. And it's even, you know, hard to imagine now if someone will tell you that uh, you should uh, write code in assembly instead of let's say Python or, ja or, 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 or Java or JavaScript. And um, Codex is yet another step toward kind of bringing computers closer to humans such that you communicate with a computer with your own language mm -hmm. rather than with a specialized language. And uh, I think that it will lead to an increase of number of people who can code. Yeah, and the, and the kind of technologies that those people will create is, it, it's innumerable. It could, you know, it could be a huge number of technologies we're not predicting at all because that's less and less requirement of uh, a t having a technical mind, a programming mind. You're not opening it to the world of um, other kinds of minds, creative minds, artistic minds, all that kind of stuff. I, I would like, for instance, biologists who work on DNA yeah. to be able to program and not to need to spend a lot of time uh, learning it. And I, I believe that's a good thing to the world. And I would actually add, I would add, so at the moment, I'm a managing codex uh, team and also language team. And I believe that there is like a plenty of brilliant people out there and they should apply. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So what's the language in the codex? So those are kind of, they're uh, overlapping teams. So it's like GPT, the raw language, and then the codex is like applied to programming. Correct. And they are quite intertwined. There are many more teams involved making this, uh, models uh, uh, extremely efficient and deployable. Okay, for instance, there are people who are working to, you know, make our data centers uh, amazing, or there are people who work on pro putting these models into production or, uh, or even pushing it at the very limit of the scale. Mm. So all, all aspects from, from the infrastructure to the actual machine learning. So I'm just saying there are multiple teams mm -hmm. while the, and uh, the team working on codex and language, uh, I guess. I'm I'm directly managing them. I would I would love to hire yeah, more. Yeah, if you're interested uh, in machine learning, this is probably one of the most exciting uh, problems and like systems to be working on because it's actually it's, it's it's pretty cool. Like what what uh, the program synthesis, like generating of programs, is very interesting, very interesting problem that has echoes of reasoning and intelligence in it. It, and I think there's a lot of fundamental questions that you might be able to sneak uh, sneak up to by generating programs. Yeah, the one more exciting thing about the programs is that, so I said that the, um, you know, the, in case of language, that one of the troubles is even evaluating language. So when the things are made up, you, you need somehow either a human to, to say that it, this doesn't make sense or so. In case of program, there is this one extra lever that we can actually execute programs and see what they uh, evaluate to. So that process might be somewhat uh, th th more automated in, in order to improve the uh, qualities of generations. Oh, that's fascinating. So like the, wow, that's really interesting. So, so for the language, the 
you know, the simulation to actually execute it as a human mind. Yeah. For programs, there is a there is a computer on which you can evaluate it. Wow. That's a brilliant little insight that the thing compiles and runs. That's first. And second, you can evaluate on a like do automated unit testing. And in some sense, it seems to me that we will be able to make a tremendous progress. You know, we are in the paradigm that there is way more data. There is like a transcription of millions of uh, of uh, software engineers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, you just mean, because I was gonna ask you about reliability. The thing about programs is you don't know if they're gonna, like a program that's controlling a nuclear power plant has to be very reliable. So I, I wouldn't start with con controlling nuclear power plant. Okay. Maybe one day, but that, that's not actually, that's not on the current roadmap. That's not the step one. And, you know, it's, it's the Russian thing. You just want to go to the most powerful, destructive thing right away, run by JavaScript. But I got you. So it's a lower impact. But nevertheless, what you're making me realize, it is possible to achieve some levels of reliability by doing testing. And right. you could you could imagine that the, you know maybe there are ways for a model to write even code for testing itself and so on. And th there exist uh, ways to create the feedback loops that the model could keep on improving by writing programs that generate tests. For the instance, just... for the instance. And that's how we get consciousness because it's meta compression. That's what you're going to write. That's what the comment. That's the prompt that generates consciousness. Compressor of compressors. You just write that. Do you think the code that generates consciousness will be simple? So let's see. I mean, ultimately the core idea behind will be simple, but there will be also decent amount of engineering uh, uh, involved. Like uh, in some sense, it seems that, you know, spreading these models on many machines, uh, it's not that trivial. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we find all sorts of uh, innovations that make our models more efficient. I believe that first models that I guess are conscious are like a truly intelligent, they will have all sorts of uh, tricks. Mm -hmm. But then again, there's a uh, Richard Sutton argument that maybe the tricks are temporary things. Yeah, that they might be temporary things. And in some sense, it's also even important to, uh, to know that even the cost of a trick. So sometimes people are eager to put the trick while forgetting that there is a cost of maintenance. Oh, or like, like a long-term cost. cost. Long, yeah. Long-term cost or maintenance, or maybe even a flexibility of code to actually implement new ideas. So even if you have something that gives you two X, but it requires, you know, 1000 lines of code, I'm not sure if it's actually worth it. So in some sense, you know, if it's five lines of code and two X, I would take it. And and we 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 see many of this, but also you know that requires some level of, I guess, lack of attachment to code that <laughs> we are willing to remove it. Yeah.